All right, Will, we're live. Thanks for hopping on the podcast with me today. Um, Thanks so much for having me, Mike. Yeah, I am excited to dive in. Uh, you, you've got a great background working with uh, a bunch of different banking companies. You're now founding Slack, Stack, not Slack, uh, for Gen Z specifically. How do you articulate what Stack is today and then what you hope it will be in the coming years? Yeah. Easiest way to dice it is team crypto, <laughs> super uh, quick and dirty. And what that really means is um, right now, if you're a teenager and you want to buy or sell crypto, you basically have two options. Option one is you kind of ghost on your parents account and you get their credentials and you know you hop on Coinbase or whatever it is. Option two is you go to an exchange that doesn't ask you your age because they're not authorized for under 18. Um, and that's usually a good sign that it's probably not a good exchange to be on. Um, and so we're sort of option three, which is fully authorized for under 18 year olds, actually built specifically for teenagers and their parents. Um, we will certainly have like a college product um, shortly as well, but really focused on like that high school audience right now. And why is it the law that prevents these companies from allowing people under 18 to trade? It's a federal U.S. law? Yeah, so I don't know if you're familiar with like a traditional, it's called a UTMA account. And what a UTMA account like in brokerage or in banking does is it allows an under 18 year old to have legal access to a financial account and can take action on that account. So like they can have their own debit card traditionally. Um, and then the, the kind of cool things that come with it are there are some tax advantages um, for parents. They can you know, like get some capital gains treatment that's not in their own income bracket. And then number two is at the age of majority, 18, traditionally in most states, um, that those assets transfer into the name of your teenager. Okay, got and it. So building that in crypto, we were the first ones to really kind of trailblaze and create that um, within the crypto stratosphere. And what's the challenge there? Is it just logistically setting up the user permissions on the account? So the person signing up is it usually they do they sign up together it's usually the minor that signs up first um it can be either actually the, the parent bears the burden of kyc they call it um which is know your customer and so that's like when they ask you to upload your driver's license and your financial information and all that stuff um and before you can actually go trade bitcoin or ethereum or whatever it is you have to have a parent attached to the account um, and so the logistics of it, there's kind of twofold. One is you have to be authorized for under 18 users. And to get that authorization, you have to have a product that meets all the requirements of, you know, that, that world. And so there's a lot of, I mean, without getting too deep into the minutia of it, it really all comes around permissioning to your point. So having a UX UI that makes sure that parents are sitting on top of things parents can decide, hey, I want to approve transactions over $25. I want to approve every single transaction. I want to, you know, approve withdrawals and deposits, you know, versus trades. Um, and so the parent and the teen is sort of the, the relationship there is how it's set up. And then our app sings to that music, if you will. Got it. Got it. How, how rigidly or how clearly does the law define what you need to do as a company and what the permissions are is it is it vague where it's like the parents must have control or is it pretty specific i think it's it's much more clear on what you can't do <laughs> and so mm -hmm. then you kind of you navigate through what you can't do to you know what you what you ask to do essentially um and so those are things like an under 18 year old and this is beyond even finance an under 18 year old actually can't enter into any contract because they're not the age of majority by themselves. And so um, coupling things with parents. And then there are also some other um, sort of burdens that you bear once you get into finance and crypto. Of Are you a money transmitter? Are you a money service business? Are you a registered investment advisor? And so you sort of circle all of those things up into now this under 18 product and package it together into, you know, stack, which is the essentially UTMA account of crypto. Got it. Got it. And did you have to, or did you build, or are you building on top of another crypto product to be able to utilize their licensing and all the backend infrastructure? 
Exactly. So the ones that people know very well in the fiat world um, are Apex and DriveWealth and Alpaca. Um, and they facilitate, like, if you want to know how much Amazon stock is worth at any given point, there's an API for that. If you want to find someone to, you know, go sell you your $100 of Amazon stock that you're buying and, like, liquidity, um, they have an API for that. Custodying your assets, they have an API for it. So they, they sort of do a full gamut of services. That world in crypto, I would say, is still very new. <laughs> it's, mm. and it's kind of, you know, going through some of the growing pains of just crypto becoming more popularized. So there's, there's actually much less um, businesses that facilitate backends, um, but there, there are a few. The one that we use also does the biggest companies they work with are Kraken, the crypto exchange, and Binance, um, which is not a crypto exchange. So they do all the backends for them. And so we'll use the, the same API base for that. Got, what, is, what, what company is that? It's called Prime Trust. Oh, okay. I, I think I actually interviewed them. Uh, Oh, a while you? back, That's cool. yeah. Uh, cool. I have to remember, but it sounds very familiar. Interesting. All right, so yeah, you really catalog, you really focus on the user experience for the Gen Z. So building backend infrastructure doesn't need to be your core competency. So effectively, outsource that piece of it. And then, what makes it a when you think about the user experience, or how would you attract uh, teens? You know, somebody seventeen or younger. I suppose it's there's some minimum age, like. 10 or is there a minimum age? 13, 13, 13. Is the minimum age. Gotcha. And that actually goes into some marketing practices. Um, once you market to 12 and under, there are a lot more stipulations you have to, um, you know, kind of sing to. So we, we are just 13 to 17. Gotcha. Gotcha. And what, what's that demographic like? I don't have too many. 13 to 17 year old friends or even relatives are they is a general demographic or life uh, of a 14 year old today on an iPhone with social media apps like what what are people doing that age now 90% of them have iPhones so which is you know go buy Apple stock <laughs> hmm. they're doing very well um, and so we actually like will only be iOS at least from the, the start so I am like doing Google Play um, the, I mean, well, first that age group, I look at myself when I was in high school and times have changed. These kids are incredibly competent. I think the number one mistake that you can make is to infantilize them um, and treat them like kids because they will just shock you with you mm. know, what they're capable of. And, and so really almost, um, and I think some other businesses that started in under 18 and then moved into just general, you know, like population realize that if you teach a 16 year old something, you actually probably teach a 50 year old something if it's the first time you're doing it too. Um, and so education is very universal that way. Our product, I think to your point of like, what are the value propositions for a teenager to, to have, download the Stack app? Number one, first and foremost, is just a safe and secure and legal environment for them to go on crypto, super easy, simple. And there will definitely be others that start to jump into this world more than just us, um, even though they're, we're the first one to do it. Number two is, I always call this like the Coinbase Earn of Gen Z. Um, and if you're familiar with Coinbase Earn as a product, they, you know, I think do a really cool job of doubling down on education and saying, we're going to give you free crypto if you do, you know, certain educational mediums on our app, like take quizzes and read our blog and do things like that. And so what we've shifted into is what does that look like for a 16 year old? And mm -hmm. perhaps very unsurprisingly, it's like, don't have them read your blog, send them a 20 second TikTok looking video. Um, and so we kind of lean into some of those things, just engagement wise. And then last, and this is not going to be day one on the app, but I think it's definitely in the immediate future. And I think about myself again, as like a high schooler, Buying and selling video games, um, I think, has to be a natural integration. And so if you go, we want to be a centralized node for under 18-year-olds that have a digital wallet so that when they earn $5 of Bitcoin on game X, then they can go turn it into Ethereum for game Y, where they want to go buy their avatar or new shoes or something. And so being that centralized node is um, definitely like early on our playbook. Yeah. Do you know the numbers or have any even back of the napkin idea as to how popular gaming is for teenagers now? Is it like, is it like just dominating social life or is it relatively consistent 
percentage of people that are into gaming? Yeah, I don't, I can't give you a, a specific percentage, but I do know that all of the data that's sort of come out since like even COVID is very, very high on digital relationshiping. And I think that we've leaned into our app that way. Creating a digital community is almost more important to teenagers than their physical community. You know, I think about like high school when I was in high school and it was the people I interacted with, you know, 99% of them went to my high school. And now with Discord and with video games, there's a massive population that is really leaning in there. Mm. So, um, so I can't give you an exact number, but I think it's certainly much higher than, you know, even five years ago. And we want to certainly be a part of just enabling some of that. Yeah, it's interesting. So I almost imagine if you're in high school now, your, your social connections are far less in person. So there's almost a detachment from the drama in person, but, but subsequently you're, you know, more concerned with what's happening online or on social media. Yeah, I think like, you know, so we have, um, we have an ambassador program, um, which you can see on our website and the ambassador program is really where you can be like the stack rep at your high school, um, or even college too. And what we've learned from that group, I mean, that's like our first node of collecting product data. Um, and having relationships directly with teens. And what we've learned from our ambassadors is, I'll say first, their profile um, is typically pretty conscientious. I mean, a lot of them are already investing in stocks. Some of them have found some of those, you know, sort of back doors into crypto themselves already. Um, and like some of them we've even found on Reddit where they've, you know, posted a discussion topic on Reddit and said like, hey, how do I legally own Bitcoin if I'm mm. 15 years old? Um, and so it's a really cool group, um, that is, that inherently likes investing a lot. A lot of them are already on discord using it for video games. Um, but I think that community has taught us that, that really high school kids these days are different in the circles that they draw around themselves. Um, and how much more universal those circles have become. And again, this is like the digital community aspect of things, um, where, you know, I think of like me in high school and it was like, if you played on a certain sports team, there was a circle there, you know, mm. or if, you know, you had a certain friend group, that was your kind of click of friends. And I don't think that, um, those exist in the same way that they used to. I think that people draw circles around things that they like to do more. I think that people draw circles again, that are outside of like a physical relationship more, and so we want to create another one of these digital communities for, you know, this like investor and, um, you know, conscientious high schooler profile that are, are early ambassadors. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's it's uh, I was thinking about this idea a couple of months ago that uh, when I was reminiscing on uh, my first exposure into the world of money, I got my grandmother gave me these. I think they're bonds, like uh, security bonds. You know, you can give a kid when they're two years old, like a hundred dollars and it has a, and you actually, you, you only have to put in like 25 or 50 and then it matures to a hundred over time. So it's, it's like, you know, grandma's like, here you go, here's a hundred dollars, but you can't spend it for another 18 years. <laughs> uh, it's a good, so it's it, a great vehicle. So it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, uh, it it was pretty useless and disappointing for me and <laughs> when I was that age. But I remember the the concept being okay. This you only put in fifty now; it's worth one hundred and fifteen years, uh, and it's accumulating kind of guaranteed interest on you know, the federal stability. You could probably do a similar thing with that in crypto, where you put in you know twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin today, and it's worth fifty dollars accumulating interest over. 15 years or so. So I imagine you guys are thinking about products uh, outside the pure buy and sell uh, exchange. You're now, Stack is now unlisted or un, it's not live, it's on wait list. Um, I'm curious, you're, where is the product now and how have you rolled it out so far? Yeah. So our product will officially go live on the App Store uh, at the end of May. And so that's, our team is, as you can imagine, scrambling, you know, to like get everything live. The biggest thing that we've been very thoughtful about is we'd rather go live with, you know, security and safety and 
even like just the quality of the product being a little bit more buttoned up than you would with maybe an average product. And that's because this is a teen and a parent audience. And, you know, I always say it's like the one strike and you're out policy Mm -hmm. where, you know, you make a mistake and there's just no appetite for that. You know, it's the zero tolerance. Um, And so we've been really thoughtful that way. And it's definitely taken us a longer time to roll out just because of that. Um, We are in production at this point. Um, We'll be on test flight soon. And that's kind of like, you know, the the first step to actually being live. Um, And then in the meantime, we continue to curate a really great wait list and also this ambassador population. The wait list is, hey, get early access to the app. You'll get the first three months of the platform for free. And so you can literally trade and buy and sell and deposit and withdrawal free. Um, and that's just to test out the platform and kind of, you know, see what it's all about. And then after, um, after the waitlist population, the ambassador group has been so informative of our product while we're not live. And so what we do is we actually take a full working demo that you can click through and it's like a pretend live account. And we have a lot of teenagers leave us videos, um, as they click through the app of what they think about certain things. And I always say, Hmm. The best data that we get is very often the unspoken data. It's the face of someone looking at something on the app and making a, "Mm, I'm not sure about that face. Um, And, you know, that is extremely informative because kids, a lot of kids don't want to be too harsh, you know, of your product when, um, you know, it's it's in the early days, but you get so much fascinating feedback um, from that group. And so we have made a lot of iterations of the app even in this incubation period that we've been building. Yeah. I think that tends to be pretty underutilized, the qualitative subjective feedback on people. Cause it's like, here's what's happening as a product developer. You, if you're gathering data, whether it's analytics or surveys or whatever, you're taking the data, you're, you're, you're taking people's experiences, their emotions about a certain product or frustrations or joys you're compressing it into numbers and then you're interpreting it back into what you need to do product wise. So I'm going to move this button, change this functionality. And if you can just directly say like, ah, why would it go to this screen? It should go to this screen. Or why can't I click that? It should go here. Like, it's Mm -hmm. just, I I find it just kind of a, it's a common sense uh, thing in in some sense, but it's also just as product developers, you can get so stuck in the weeds and not see the obvious things that people are tripping over. Oh, it's so incredible, honestly. and, And it's even feedback that like, you don't always get when the app is live too. You can plug in all the CRM, you know, mm-hmm. like widgets that you want into your app, but sometimes it's not going to tell you that same story of someone literally clicking through it with a video on their face, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's like people were really navigating um, away from this really essential part of our app, for instance. And it was incredibly clear that either one of two things were happening. One, they didn't resonate with it and it just like, it wasn't getting through. Or two, we needed to do some education on what you were looking at, you know, and like, and so just some of those lessons you take on the nose and you like kind of go back to the drawing board and see what you're doing and having those lessons before we're even live as a platform, I think is so powerful. Mm. And had you worked on anything for this age group before, or, or what was it that you were kind of inspired to tackle this group in particular? Yeah, I, I helped stand up the um, the investing the under eighteen investing product at another company called Copper, um, which is a PNW based startup. They're I think they're at seven hundred and fifty thousand users now, so they're doing really cool things. Um, and they were primarily a bank, so you know, like a product for teenagers to graduate high school with a credit score, have their own debit card, save, get allowance in, all those things. Um, and then, you know, I think at some point the, the CEO, Eddie there wanted to stand up this like investing product. And so I led the charge for that. And I think that was super informative for what we were creating at Stack. I mean, Stack is, I think, really different in our core product being Web3. And Web3 is just such a different user group. If you think about it, every high school teenager has to wait, has to have a way to spend money, right? So they need a debit card, whether it's their parents' debit card or their own. And nobody really has cash these days. And so um, that was very inherent. Whereas investing is a totally different, you know, mind frame and zeitgeist and group of kids too. And so the biggest mission that we have at Stack is actually, hey, we know we're going to get this group of really conscientious teens that really care about crypto or investing 
uh, or finance. How do we get the rest? And that's our mission. It is how do we make it so approachable to be a part of this world and demystify it in a way that if we think if we can get a majority of the population investing early, then they will be so much more financially suited for success once they're adults and they have their own income and, you know, have a much more money to actually invest themselves. Uh, it reminds me when I first, uh, I was an early user of Venmo, uh, being in payments, I think running this podcast, somebody mentioned it and Venmo in the beginning had a refer a friend program where if you texted somebody a link, uh, or sent it to him on Facebook, I think. Uh, but either way, you, you sent him a link to, to Venmo and they click that link, then they would be registered through your account and you get $5. And they made it where, you know, you open up your phone, iOS, you import your contacts, and then you just send these messages out. Uh, and if you send it to people, it's like you can just click a button and send it to everyone. And back then I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll send it to everyone in my contact book. But sure enough, people like 99% <laughs> of people actually appreciated it. And they, they, a lot of people signed up and I remember getting like a, like hundreds of dollars of uh, income from Venmo on the $5 a person sign up. And I know that's like, there's different philosophies on paying for user acquisition, but the, 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 so when it comes to money and like money apps, people, I feel are so low to convert from ads and so higher to convert on a, on a referral that it's like, don't spend the $5 on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, spend it on, you know, referral fees. Um, so oh my gosh. I, yeah. You're speaking, you're, you're speaking my language. So over 50% of our entire wait list was referred by existing wait list users. Mm. And so we have, we have used that exact strategy and doubled down on it time and time again where um, part of being an ambassador, you pick several tracks. So like, let's say you're interested in product. We, we like have you interface with our product leader pretty often, like once a month and you get some mentorship and you also kind of decode as a high school, like what does product really mean? What is that job? You know, is this something that I'm interested in? Is this something I should study in college? But what you also do is you get a referral code and we actually, we take them to high schools. So I'll show you on the, hmm. the screen here. I, I go to high schools and I show up with like these like NFT stickers that kids can, you know, like throw on their computers or whatever. And on the back of them are these little business cards with our QR code um, for our wait list. And so we actually send these to our ambassadors. And so they can, you know, go like pass out what are equivalents of business cards and they get paid. Um, and so they, they bring us users and we will pay them to be on our wait list um, because really it's like the community building that we're trying to do most. Yeah. So how did you structure it? I know there's many different ways to structure uh, affiliate programs. Did you, yeah. How are you guys building it now? We basically have said to your point, um, if whatever we think that our cost of acquisition would be on something like TikTok, for instance, which is our, our number one, you know, like social channel, whatever we think that is, why would we not pay another user for bringing that person on board? Um, and it also creates instant community, right? Because now two friends are on the platform together rather than two random people that sell our you know, TikTok. Mm -hmm. And so we um, have continued to do a lot of things like that. The way that the wait list is set up is the more referrals that you do, you actually jump people. And so like, it's almost a very simple point system. If you refer three people successfully and they join the wait list, then you have three points and you're ahead of anybody with two points or one point, mm. or zero points. And so the top 250 people, not only will they have everything that the waitlist users get, which is three months of the app for free, they'll also get a $50 deposit of any crypto of their choice in their account on day one of the app. Um, and so that's, again, just like doubling down on community. We've seen a few people on the waitlist. There's a, there's a guy on the waitlist who has brought us over 400 people. Wow. Um, single handedly. And what and the so deal is those for everyone. Super excited. And he's getting fifty dollars per person he brings in. He's being he, he's in the top two, but he's going to get fifty dollars in his account. And then he also we do structure a separate referral fee that um, can be rewarded either as Bitcoin in your account, or we can literally just send you a PayPal um, cash. And that is just our cost of acquisition. So that's not fifty bucks. It's Got much it. lower than that. But um, how much is that? Yeah, fifty bucks would be great. 
uh, it changes. It's a dynamic mm. fee because our cost of acquisition is always changing. And it also changes based on like, there are a few people that sent for our wait list and they have 250,000 followers on TikTok, And so that person's, um, you know, our relationship with that person is obviously a little bit different than somebody who's going to go, you know, like send it to two friends or something. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's, it's tiered based on mm. that. It would be, I assume it would be the more people you have access to, the more per person. Is that right? Or is it the other way around? It's well, it's actually kind of the other way around, mm. but you get a flat fee for doing some things like, so for instance, the guy that's brought us 400 people, we'll give him every time he does a post just for, you know, even doing a post about us, we'll give him an actual flat fee. Whereas if we haven't started an existing relationship with you and we don't know what the output's going to be, mm. we're just going to give you money for, you know, doing a post about stack because, and there are a lot of businesses that will do that. It's, mm. it is incredible how much, I don't know if you've talked to anybody in like the Finfluencer community. There was a kid quite candidly that told me he would not accept a post for under $7,000. Wow. And on, on TikTok? On TikTok. Damn. Under 7,000. And he's a I kid? He's under 18? Him. He's, I think he's 17. Um, I literally <laughs> said to him, A, I hope if you're getting that, that's amazing. And B, I can't afford you. <laughs> God. How many followers on TikTok does he have? I think he had like four or five million. So, I mean, he okay. Pretty what, solid what, what, what's resonating in that world? Like when you're 17 years old and you have 5 million followers, are you just doing dancing meme videos all day? And that just connects? Well, I'll share what we've learned from TikTok, which is once you hit the mega influencer world, call it, you know, a million plus followers, that group, it's, it's really hard to have a truly curated community meaning different companies that you might feature or brands or products are just going to not resonate with the total population. They're going to resonate with a subsect of it. Whereas if we do a post with somebody that's 200,000 followers, but all they do is finance, for instance, or mm-hmm. they do is investing posts. And so they do two or three features a month, probably with different companies and different apps. That group, the bang for your buck is incredibly higher quality than mm-hmm. what you're going to pay somebody who has 5 million followers. Because you're going to pay way more money, obviously, because they have a much bigger following. But the output in our experience has been much lower, actually. That's interesting. Um, Yeah. And so for those like the mega influencers that have millions of followers, to your point, like most often their content is kind of all over the place. You know, it's like they kind of have the formula in their mind of like first two seconds needs to be this. Then the next five seconds needs to be this. But they plug that into cooking and finance and clothing and whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is is probably also there's an effect where if you're watching that kind of stuff, like if you're going to your your girl or your guy that's pushing that out there, you're not you don't even want to think about finance. You know, your brain is like, okay, let's just relax and consume this dancing video. And so the second you get hit with like, oh, check out this app, you're like, ugh, gross. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Whereas, to- if, it's so yeah, true. Yeah. I mean I think about that. When I go to I use YouTube more, but if I go to YouTube, if I'm tuning into a, a finance video, then like, yeah, let's let's think about that. But if I'm not, if I'm watching a basketball highlights video, it's like the last thing I want to see is some ad across. So yeah, to your point, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. To focus on the right group. And and Uh, we, I think that that is an incredibly, like that is a, that's a marketing lesson that every single person should know. And we kind of didn't learn until, you know, a few, a few months into doing a lot of trial and error our own. Um, But organically LinkedIn, very interestingly is our number one source. Really? And I think that comes from, the fact that there are starting to be, I mean, LinkedIn has even changed, I think in the last couple of years of just like the quality of, I think LinkedIn is becoming a much stronger community, like a professional, you know, social community, but there are way more high schoolers on LinkedIn than I ever remember. Ah. And because, you know, if we can curate some interesting, like I do some, I just write blogs, for instance, I wrote one, last week about like my first year of being a founder and like what I would tell myself, you know, one year ago about, um, you know, like how to go on this journey. We do some stuff like that. We try to keep it pretty high quality and it's always about business and it's like not plugging stack, you know, it's not like, Oh, we're this cool app. It's like, Hey, we're just trying to, here's about entrepreneurship or business or whatever, a a problem we encountered. 
And if you do some of that, I think like the authenticity of it really resonates. And you're also to your point in this professional community already, right? And so you're getting hit with this, oh, here's this company that's doing this cool web three thing that's actually built for me as a consumer. I'm going to go check it out. Um, versus yeah. on TikTok, you know, sometimes you're just looking for the, you know, guy that's doing the goofy dance or the girl that's doing surgery on a watermelon or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, went, I wonder if LinkedIn is intentionally targeting that group or just all around doing a better job. But I, I would not have guessed that teenagers are on LinkedIn avidly. It's funny. I mean, it usually, I will say, I don't think that, I think that there's a, I'm guessing here, but like 5% of high schoolers are actually on LinkedIn, but the mm -hmm. ones that are hit our user group really well, because they're usually, you know, very conscientious. I always call them like, they're the DECA teens. If you're, if you're familiar with DECA, um, you know, that are like, it's like a really, it's like the top 1% of high schoolers that are getting great grades and, you know, doing a ton of extracurricular activities. They're a part of this group called DECA. And like, what is that? What is that? Is that just a, our, is it just an informal? It's it's like, it's, really, it's a group that has been around for a hundred years and they like do, they curate events. Like I think there's a retreat once a year for high schoolers and then they do monthly events too, like more locally, wherever you are. And it's a way to like, you know, meet teens that maybe are thinking similarly to you. They do like some stock market competitions, for instance, mm. um, some stuff like that. And it's just funny that like half of our ambassadors happen to be in DECA. You know, it's like this group of kids that are yeah, definitely were outperforming me in high school. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise cool me. Things. I mean, I, the only people where I'm thinking who are, are going out of their way to invest in crypto or learn about crypto are people who have accumulated some money doing something, which is unlike most people in high school. And then to be able to have the <laughs> intellectual capacity to say, okay, I got to think about investing it instead of just, you know, s creating a checking account, letting it sit there. Yeah, that's uh, there's a go-getters for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And, and high school has changed too, I think, you know, I mm. think that they're that population, you know, to the benefit of, um, teens now, like I even think about copper, you know, the company that I used to work with, they, they have an amazing product that I wish existed when I was in high school, you know, and yeah. it just gets more people involved and thinking, oh, maybe I should be investing too, you know, or, oh, I was going to go spend this on a burger or on a movie or something. And, Maybe I should put this, you know, it, in something. And they do a similar thing, but for fiat, is that right? Yeah, or? just total fiat business. Exactly. So they do primarily banking stuff. So like, you know, a place for you to learn how to periodically save, put some goals on there. Like, oh, I want to save for a car. I want to save for college. I want to save to go buy a new video game console, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and then help you get there um, and help you sort of think about your spending habits versus what maybe you get an allowance or a summer job or however you're generating money. Mm. Um, and so they do a lot of that stuff, but all, obviously all in a fiat system. Mm. And what I discovered when I was there, which is kind of the impetus for Stack, was all of the fiat under 18 products really couldn't do crypto. And that's because they sit in this very encumbered, regulatory, buttoned right. up environment that is thinking about adding Bitcoin and Ethereum in the next 12 to 18 months. And like kids are already buying crypto illegally, you know, on the internet. And so it's like, you, you have to start where they already are. You have to start in crypto and you have to give them the full gamut of products and you have to, you know, you can't do this like crawl, walk, run strategy. You have to just dive in the deep end. Mm. So do you see Stack being, I imagine you're an early acquisition target, you know, once, once you even have a basic functionality for some of these bigger companies, is that something you would entertain or do you have a persistent focus on longer term or had you not thought about it? <laughs> no, it's I know it's early. Question. Um, no, it's, it, it's actually, it's funny. I, I was um, meeting up with a founder buddy of mine last night and we were talking about this exact thing. It's, it's a funny stage that you get to like, you know, a year or 18 months into being a founder where it feels like you're expected almost to have an idea of what the outcome that you want is. And it really changes your decision making, right? Because if we go, you know, this comes from luxury because this was not always the case. Fundraising was not always easy, but we have a lot of, I think, cool interest from venture capitalists, for instance. 
but venture capitalists are lo- their game is looking for the next PayPal, right? Or mm-hmm. the next Square, mm-hmm. you know, or Venmo. To your point, I think if you aren't going to go chase that exit, then you're doing a disservice by even taking their money in the first place, right? Um, and you're definitely not going to win in any VC room if you tell them, "Hey, I'm going to go take you know a small exit." So that changes my life, but probably doesn't change your fund's life. And so I think there is a really interesting decision there of saying how how much do we want to grow, you know, and are we a public company? And one of the hardest things about being a founder sometimes is I always say like it's like building a skyscraper um, where you you feel like you're you're already building the next level, and then you know the level right now is is being completed, but it's really hard to like picture floor fifty two when you're on floor fifteen, you know. Yeah. Um, and so like, you're kind of expected to have this vision now of what would it look like if you were a public company or a billion dollar company or something. And you're like trying to like chase down error number 54 in the app, you know, yeah. still. And so it's just, it's a little far from reality. So I, I, I didn't really answer your question. Yeah. Uh, I think my direct answer is, um, I think I'm grappling with that question a little bit myself right now. And I think it'll feed into whatever next funds we take as business. Mm. It's interesting. My in my experience, I've started uh, three companies uh, and have raised money for. I've started four, raised money for three, and sold uh, three of them. And one one was a good exit. The other two were kind of like uh, you know, aqua hire type things. And the my experience is that you tend to. It's like driving a car through inconsistent fog where sometimes you can't even see five feet in front of the car and you just can see where you're driving enough to you know, need to go really slow. Then sometimes the fog will break and you're like, oh, there's, there's, a, there's the lighthouse. Or there's the mm. destination miles in the future. And then another cloud comes in. You're like, ah, but I don't know how the fuck we're going to get there. And it's complicated <laughs> and, and you don't see it again. But it, it changes. It's not as if you know directly because the world changes, you know, there's other products in the market or other opportunities. I, I, I also f- feel that the, the, there's waves of this. There's waves of like crypto is a huge wave where our entire financial system is changing to jump onto a more adaptive crypto for all the reasons that is beneficial. There's also the wave of social media, that, which encompasses many smaller waves inside of it. Like we were talking about the breaking up of the physical social groups into digital social groups, which then get reconsolidated into other online digital interest groups. And so that's happening. And then there's a, uh, a, a reprioritization of what we deem as like valuable goals to achieve in society. So people's followings can be based on all sorts of different things. So we're seeing that, that, uh, that, that fragmentation happening where you're like, you can be, I mean, anything, you, if you do anything really well and you're persistent in it, it will attract the following. People love just seeing people get really adept at new things. So there's, there's all of these different waves going on. And I find you want to parse out the waves that you can ride for a, a good period of time. You know, and it, it seems pretty clear. Sometimes businesses are, are less clear about what the wave is, or even if there is a wave at all, you certainly don't want to be going the other direction where you're climbing uphill uh, which usually means that you're late to the game. You, you're starting a business doing uh, on-demand transportation you know, six years after Uber has raised a billion dollars. Um, mm-hmm. But then, then obviously you can be too early. And if you're too early, it looks like you struggle to raise money because not only can you not convince people that this wave that you're articulating exists, but you can't even accumulate any data uh, from users that it, it's happening. So, you know, if you try to start, you know, if you, if you just try to start things too early. So a huge part of it is timing. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I think that's so true. I think this, like, having a pulse on the zeitgeist that you're chasing, you know, mm-hmm. is so important for whatever. Like for, for us, I think there's like there was this moment when I knew it was time to build stack that had accumulated in my brain for like 10 years. But then it was like. I could finally answer, call it the, the, you know, slide in your pitch deck. That's why now. Mm. And it was why now, because there had been this way over indexing on access in finance and you saw wall street bets and you saw, you know, like the GameStop thing happen. 
And there was all of a sudden this flood of retail investors because all of a sudden you were paying $0 commissions to buy $5 of Amazon stock in one second. And that was such a great user experience all of a sudden, rather than like looking at a candlestick chart 10 years ago on charleschwab.com, you know, and being like, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Um, and so that created this amazing swath of retail investment. But then there was this like, this kind of like burn period, right? Where a bunch of people got burned and saw their portfolio go red, or they got burned by these like big people in the market. And that's where you say, whoa, there is a, a job for the private sector to catch up on education, to pair with that access. And that's really what Stack is built to do. It's taking the most fun, exciting technology and it's pairing it with like really fundamental education, which is just, hey, you don't need to be a hedge fund manager to be an investor. And actually, you know, if you're if we're talking about the stock market, you should probably be in the S&P of Index and you should probably have your investments up there for 10 years, um, you know, and like, so sort of doubling down on some of that stuff. And I think the best financial products automate all that behavior for you. Like mm. Acorns, for instance, was such a great new tool. And they were the first ones to just say like, let's round things off and put it in a portfolio for you and we'll diversify it immediately. And it'll just happen, you know, in the background of everything else that you're doing. And I think now there's this like, how do you make, how do you turn the automation on in something like ed education, which is inherently not automated, right? It's like this manual frictionful thing that like kids go to school all the time and are being told what to do. And so a huge solution that our app is trying to solve and we get smarter about every day is what does that automated education, if you will, that really resonates with this teen user group look like? Mm. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is what what's in order to know what to teach people, you have to know what the thing that's wrong is. Like, what what is bad yeah. investment decision and bad investment advice? And say, well, it, it start from the obvious, which would be you can just spend it all on something that's not even valuable to you today. Right. So like, let's go and buy a thousand dollars worth of candy. And then, <laughs> and then that's probably bad. That's probably almost undisputably bad investment advice. Uh, so there's a control on impulse. And I think that's probably the first thing kids understand is like impulse control and the accumulation of uh, that's probably the simplest version. And then there's this idea that like saving, right? We emphasize that for young children with allowances and you could make a decision between you spend it on getting something you want now or you accumulate it over time. Uh, then it gets more complicated into the value of what a dollar is worth today versus uh, you know weeks in the future, interest, compound interest, investing. Those are almost like second order um, ab abstractions of what money is with time over time and how you invest it. Um, and I wonder if there, this is the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking about Reddit and the, the, the stonks is what's, what's the piece of classical education that you would give that's not relevant to today. And then what's the piece of relevant information about the way the world is working that people just aren't teaching in schools. Cause I, I look at Reddit, I'm like, that is an incredibly efficient means of collective communication through this Reddit platform that allowed retail investors to consolidate their efforts and effectively be a hedge fund. And it just happened semi-organically. And I think like if you understood that and what it is that's actually happening with buying and calling out the shorts, the hedge funds, it's like maybe maybe there there's the new education. Like what can you do that's kind of counter narrative? So I don't know if you have any reaction to that, but... <laughs> Oh, I, 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 so, I mean, I'm sure we could talk about this for later for hours, but the, I have tons of reactions to it. And I actually think that this is, this is classic, like kind of miseducation on social media, right? It's actually that a lot of people, most, the majority of people actually didn't make money on Wall Street bets. And it's like, oh, we beat the hedge funds as a group, which they did squeeze, you know, like mm. some hedge funds. And that's definitely true. But the people that actually benefited most from that whole Wall Street bets situation were a few like traders that were on Wall Street bets four years or five years before Wall Street bets ever happened, right? Where that whole game something happened and had been options trading things were incredibly sophisticated investors, you know, and like 
So the retail, like the average retail investor actually didn't win in that scenario, but it's, it's almost like given as a badge of win for retail investing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, a, that's a really curious gray area to like kind of decode, right? It's like, I, I was thinking when you're talking about investing too, then the first quiz question on our entire app that we ask is what makes something an investment? And I think the biggest like misconception about what makes something an investment, people think that a stock is an investment, right? And that's just what an investment is. But actually anything can be an investment. It's how you use that thing that makes it an investment. And so thinking about like your decision making as a teenager, that if you're asking your mom for the new iPhone, that's an investment. If you're gonna go monetize a social media account on Mm -hmm. that iPhone, or you're going to put it in a glass case because you think that the iPhone 13 is going to have some future value once we're on Mars, you know? Um, And so I think it's like really taking this world and decoding it and saying, this isn't like about being an options or futures trader on the stock market. Like that's not what being a good investor is and actually looks like. That's this like very tiny portion of the casino marketplace of the stock market that Most people will never have this and don't need to have the sophistication to be successful. on. But what the stock market can also be and is for most people is a form to combat things like inflation. And so every day of your life that you are actually not involved in investing, you're just missing out because your dollar is declining in value of what it's actually going to go give you. And you don't have more dollars in a bag somewhere that's outperforming everybody else's dollars. And so you just need to go capture your eight or 9% every year on the SBO entered index so that you keep up with the world around you. And that's what's separating the wealth gap, you know? And so it's like, I think creating these, um, these lessons in a way that resonates and you can take them to like the iPhone example so that it's really tangible for a, a teenager. That's step one, right? And then our app actually is built and we're getting smarter every day. And this is certainly by no means the, the solution yet. But our app gets more complicated with more complicated strategies when you're ready for them and mm. you've graduated from doing certain things. And so it's like, hey, before you go put your money in Kim Kardashian's meme coin, which is where some people are starting, you should also understand like what is an investment? Because if you can't answer that question, then you certainly shouldn't be, you know, putting stuff in and stuff on your Instagram, mm. you mm. know? Um, and so I think it's really just like truly trying to educate, but it's trying to educate using this zeitgeist of excitement around crypto and web three and bragging to your friends that you own bitcoin and you know saying that you know what the blockchain is and actually knowing what the blockchain is like all of that stuff is the zeitgeist that we're using to actually make education engaging yeah it's so it's i I love talking about financial advice because it feels it feels kind of like the thing that people are sort of scared to talk about a little bit, but, but, and everyone kind of has their own perspective on it and, and everyone, I think deep down knows they don't fully understand it. Uh, and you know, you have to like give the big legal disclaimer, this is not financial advice and we're not giving financial advice. And, and we have, so we have a le- we have a, a governmental legal concern. It's so important that we say by law, you have to disclose that it's not financial advice. You'd be registered financial advisor, like with a certificate and a degree and all that. And so it's a serious thing. Uh, namely that I think the concern is when people are abusing it, they're saying, Hey, go buy this stock. Meanwhile, they're trying to, they're trying to get, when people are doing investment advice maliciously, what, what I think is really happening is they know something you don't, they're not telling you the truth and you you're falling trapped to it by not by trusting this person and by not uh understanding the the mechanism of the investment deep down we've all been victim of this right it's like you see some news article or this company raised money or whatever signal it is and you just kind of i mean i read a twitter storm by some early stage investor of fast that just you know crumbled after raising 100 million and it's like in hindsight, you can recognize the lessons, but it's difficult to really internalize them in the moment. It's so true. And I think that to your point of like getting preyed upon, one of the first wake ups that I ever had in my life was I worked one of my first clients ever um, was a market maker, which is like the algorithmic trading desks on the stock market that trade without a human intervention um, or very little human intervention. And what one of the desks that was making literally hundreds of millions of dollars a day 
what what it did was it literally said we know human beings put limit orders in the stock market at round dollar values meaning like hundred dollars mm-hmm. or 110 dollars and so they would go and buy a bunch of stock at ninety nine dollars and ninety eight cents, knowing that they could go sell it to a bunch of people at a hundred dollars. And so it's like really these very silly, pretty honestly dumb, you know, like you think these algorithms are doing all these ridiculously complicated things, and it's actually they're preying on human thought mm. and they're preying on the individual making decisions about, hey, Kim Kardashian did this post, I'm going to go invest in it. Um, because I like Kim Kardashian, I resonate with her brands. And I think there is, it's about information and it's about, I think the biggest way to win the game is to like do the least sexy thing, Mm. whatever the least sexy thing is, is usually the right answer. It is. And that's what we try to, and that's the trickiest thing. about. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Why is it the least sexy? The thing that's in sexy is what, what is glamorous. Yeah, what's glamorous, what people are talking about, what's sexy is to go invest in GameStop on the day that, you know, all of the that GameStop was on CNBC. But the actual right thing was probably to not invest in GameStop and go put your money in the SPF Index. And I can't, I, you know, I don't want to quote prices because um, I'm talking in, in not actuality, but I can guarantee you that if you had done the SPF Index on that day, instead of doing GameStop, you probably have yeah. Um, and so I think that, and that's, I, I was one of those people, well, literally, and I'm, this is like coming from personal experience. We've all been burned before. We have all had some investment not go the way that we want it to. And a lot of the time it's because we're chasing what we think we know, which is fed through information portals, like social media and other things that is late information. It's delayed information. It could be really just like bad or misinformation totally too. And so I think um, taking yourself out of those mechanisms and just saying, if I don't, if if like, I'm not going to actually beat the market, which almost no active investors actually do, then just do the passive strategy. That's super vanilla. That doesn't actually take a ton of complexity to understand. And you'll probably outperform everybody else by doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be diversified, put it in the market. Yeah. That seems to be the best simple advice. I think, so we have five pillars on our app and the five pillars are long-term holding, periodic savings, diversification, and then we have engagement and learning. And the one that I always get questions on is engagement, but I think engagement would actually be the most important thing because I like investing, but I will admit I go on my Charles Schwab app, which is where, you know, my stock accounts are once every three months. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's not a fun UX UI experience. I really don't have any purpose to be on it unless I'm like shifting investments around. And so if you can actually solve the engagement problem of making someone have a better relationship with their portfolio in the first place and see the days that it goes red, because actually like seeing your portfolio go red is part of it. It's a lesson. You're going to be way better at investing if something, once that first thing doesn't work out. And if you could get that lesson with $20 when you're 16 years old, rather than for $5,000 when you finally have a salary in your 20s, it would be so much more beneficial. And that those are the things that we're trying to instill in those investing pillars that, you know, we have a bunch of mechanisms on the app that really like double down on them. Yeah. I, I almost think that the the investment decision somebody makes that we call successful and that it 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 goes up is your effectively predicting the future you're you're you, and likely you have some insight into some either it's a market with a number of different companies or one individual company and you see things before other people see things and that information is usually not in these apps like they 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 might you know fidelity and charles Schwab, but the standard at which they give it to you is the same as everybody else so it's like trying to fly in a plane without knowing how to fly the plane and you only get to access like some of the controls, not even all the controls. And so I think that's where you see really breakout investors. There's certainly network effects in in private investing where the more great investments you make, the more deal flow you get and better deals you see. But aside from that, there's also this ability to pick the winners, which comes down to pattern matching and being able to see within say just the payment industry or healthcare or whatever it is, you see the patterns and you understand, okay, this, this approach probably not going to work like this, 
these people don't have the experience. They're going in a direction against the wind and you just write that off. But every once in a while you see a good one. And that, that information, that's, a, that's not about money. That's not about stocks. It's like, th this is about the real world. And because money is just a scorecard. And I think that's where a lot of people, myself included, were often tricked. Like maybe if I look at the graphs, like there, there is that discipline, right? People track pips and they make investment decisions based on the, on the graphs. But I don't know, personally, that just never really resonated with me. Um, I, I agree with you. And I think that there's this, this like qualitative, like we talk about qualitative with products, I think qualitative for investing and I'll throw a disclaimer that this is not investing advice, but the, the I do think that there's this part of investing where teenagers actually might have better information than a lot of sophisticated investors. And that's because money slowly trickles down from generation to generation. If you ask somebody in 1995, you know, a teenager that was on AOL or had a AIM screen name, you should invest in the internet. They'd be like, hell yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But if you were a 50 year old investing, you might be like, mm, I'm not sure about the internet yet. I think I'm going to wait on that. One, yeah. You know? And it's like, there's some general intuition here that I actually think younger generations are uniquely positioned to have better perspectives on. Um, and that like goes back to just the, you know, like the, the very general advice in investing of being invested in products that you understand, yeah. you know? Um, and that's where, I mean, again, on our app, like not to keep plugging the app, but there is a place that we make you watch a video on every single crypto before you ever invest in it. And so to even unlock being able to trade Bitcoin, you have to watch our 30 second video about Bitcoin, you know, and it's not going to make you a Bitcoin expert, you know, but it's going to make you at least understand what you're putting money into, Yeah, you know? And so I think like, even if you can do that base level of understanding, that's important. Yeah. I almost think every VC firm should have like a 15 year old just on speed dial. They get so disconnected, right? Especially the older you get. <laughs> like what apps do you have on the main screen of your iPhone right now? How do you get to school? <laughs> <laughs> That is an amazing comment. And it's so funny because I talked to a, a 16 year old venture capitalist like two days ago. No way. And I was so impressed. He had sold software to Tesla, autonomous driving software to Tesla at age 16. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, I don't know if the world has changed or if this is just like an outlier conversation. You know, it's just like, what? there are some kids that will just impress you so much. He started a company and then sold it to Tesla? Yeah, I was like, how do you actually have a venture capital firm? He's like, oh, it's in my dad's name because I can't legally yeah. be the one that does it. I was like, that's amazing. That's very, yeah, that's very strange. <laughs> I don't know how you can, <laughs> yeah. why Tesla would buy it from him. But yeah, I mean, that is amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. It's, anyway, yeah. I mean, the, the, the 30,000 foot is these kids, I think, will will be so exciting to learn from every time that I get to, interface with the new teenager that joins our ambassador program or anything else. It just like, I feel like I learned something new. Yeah. And so being able to like, not be scared of, you know, Gen Z or even Gen Alpha at some point, you know, which is the next one. It's like, you know, there's, a, there's a lot to learn from each other. Mm. It's a good way to approach it. And are you guys doing any kind of unique, um, maybe not social, maybe social media, but you mentioned TikTok. Would you do a conference or, Anything that um, I'm thinking in what ways when you're targeting this group, are you marketing differently than than other companies? And certainly the platform you're using, but I'm, are there other things that you guys have thought about? So um, a sort of like Web3 hackathon is on our short mm -hmm. list that we want to host with a few other companies that are kind of like in a similar circle as us. Um and then I think like really where this ambassador program goes in the next level of it, mm -hmm. we're going to move to a discord channel pretty soon. And then we're starting to put on some really cool monthly events. They're totally optional to go to, but they're just stuff that we think like creating value for teenagers. We're going to start to create this really cool community inherently. And so I have a buddy of mine who has like a, an Instagram account with a couple million followers and it's like a totally unrelated to finance or anything. And it's just a, he's a fun guy. He's going to come in and talk about like what it was like to build their account from zero to, you know, four or five million people. 
And some of those things that I think teenagers are all thinking about, right? Like, what is it like to be a social media influencer? Or what is it like to found a company? And so bringing in some compelling people that can just create value, like that stuff, I think will come back in dividends mm -hmm. by people being like, oh, what's Stack all about? I should check this out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's really just creating value first. Love it, man. Well, you guys are, are onto the races uh, and unlaunched, which is unusual for us to dive into, but I, I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to chat. And coming out late May, you said? Late May. Sweet. May 26, I think, is our soft date. Sweet. And the site is tristack.io. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. Tristack.io. T R Y S T A C K.io. Nice, man. And are you, uh, you have your blog. Is that on Medium? Where are you on the interwebs? Where can people find you? Yep. Yeah. I'm on, you can, um, obviously LinkedIn me, which is, you know, LinkedIn and then will dash rush super easy, or you can, you can find me on medium. I do, um, I do some blogging mostly about founder stuff and entrepreneurship. Um, and then, yeah, track us on stack. We, we post, you know, stuff like this, like podcasts and then, you know, any, um, any articles that we write, we have our own blog on there too, about like finance, you know, and crypto and web three. Um, so check us out on the website, join the wait list. You'll get three months of the app for free. You can check it out when it's live, get first access. Um, and yeah, excited to talk to you, Mike. It was really fun. Sweet, man. Congrats, Will. Keep crushing. Thanks. Appreciate it.